Hello, welcome to Real Life Church. My name is Stacy, And I'm Anthony. We are so excited to be here with you, no matter what day of the week it is. But probably Sunday. Probably. Hey, and if it's Sunday, then in just a couple days, this Wednesday, uh, Pastor Jim is starting a new seminar. It's a three-week class uh, about C.S. Lewis. And if you've ever read any of his books, or maybe you haven't, or you know someone who has, like, we would love for you to come hang out with us for those three weeks on Wednesday nights at 6.30. Be here at our Glendora campus. Yes, that's going to take place in the chapel. You can always go to reallife.la slash events to see information about any of the things we're talking about. Also coming up this month, speaking of events, the, speaking of events, at the end of this month is a giant outdoor concert party we are throwing because spring is going to be here and the rain is going to be gone. We are so excited to have our friends from Nashville coming in to provide music for that. And also the habit truck is going to be here. So we want everyone to participate and be part of it. But the most important part you need to focus on today is go to reallife.la slash events so that you can buy your dinner tickets from the habit truck. We want to make sure that you get to enjoy that before those tickets sell out. The event is free, but if you want to eat, you got to buy those tickets. And speaking of parties, this last Sunday was Easter. It was a party. We had baptisms in church. Those happen because of your generosity. So thank you for being a generous church. I just want to show you two quick pictures of Emily and Natalie, sisters who are watching online, much like you're doing right now. So hi, girls. Uh, and said, hey, mom, we want to get baptized. And so we baptized them on Easter. And also... And also we got to baptize Julianne. Julianne has been ready for baptism for a little bit, like a year, and finally said, mom, <laughs> Easter is the day it's going to happen. We were so honored to be part of her big public declaration of her faith on Easter Sunday. And, and to support our ministry so we can keep baptizing more people, it's easy to do. You go to Real Life slash give or, or email us at info at reallife.la. We'll help you out. Those are the things that we have for today. We're going to throw to Pastor Jim. We'll see you right here after that. Hey, Real Life Church, it's Pastor Jim. It's good to be with you again. God bless you all. Thanks to all of you who came to our Easter services. If you weren't here, we were in a tent outside in the pouring rain, and it worked. Uh, we rented this giant tent, and everybody came and brought a friend, and we didn't uh, ruin any instruments or equipment. It was terrific. So thanks to all of you who came. Uh, now you know what a deep-fried marshmallow peep tastes like. If that, is on, if that was on your bucket list, you can check that one off. Uh, but we had a great worship service. Uh, I had friends who came who have barely been to church at all in their lives, who maybe came to Alpha for the first time. And uh, I knew many people who were there who are kind of on the fence about God and faith. And, uh, and many of you brought friends who are newcomers to our church. So appreciate that. That's a, that's a, good, it's a good spiritual gathering right there. Uh, and starting this month... <clears throat> We're going to have a, a three-week class that I'm teaching on C.S. Lewis. So if you're in the neighborhood, uh, we're going to do a three-week Wednesday night class on C.S. Lewis starting on the 10th. And uh, I, I chased down a rabbit trail in preparation for this class this time because I, I knew C.S. Lewis's mom's maiden name was Hamilton. And I have a grandmother whose maiden name was Hamilton. And because genealogies are such that records are better kept than ever before, I was able to kind of chase his family line and my family line, line back. And if you go back five or six generations, there was a, a, a time where my Hamiltons and his Hamiltons both lived in two cities in North Ireland that were nothing more than a horsey ride apart from each other. And I'm pretty sure we're related. And if you go back 500 years, we're definitely related. So I'm just gonna, from here on out, act like C.S. Lewis and I are of the same DNA and spiritual lineage. <laughs> It might sound petty, but you're going to hear a lot about it, just so you know. We're going to continue today, uh, post-Easter, in our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Because remember, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus laying out his constitution for the kingdom that he is building. And Easter is not separate from that because he went into Palm Sunday on their 
Independence Day on their Passover holiday, and people cheered for the king who, was come, who had come, thinking he was going to throw out Rome and King Herod. And that's not the way it went. And in the end, they forced a crown of thorns on his head. They put a, a, a purple robe on his shoulders in mockery, and they put a sign on the cross that says the King of the Jews. Because he did come preaching a kingdom, but not the kind they expected. The people wanted an earthly king. The Romans were afraid of an earthly king. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And yet his kingdom begins when we seek to follow him. So the Sermon on the Mount is laying out this constitution for Jesus' new kingdom. Uh, a constitution in which uh, you've been told don't murder, but in this kingdom, we're not even going to hold on to anger towards one another. We're not even going to call each other bad names. You've been told don't commit adultery, but in this kingdom, we don't even look at each other like objects. You've been uh, told love your neighbor, but in this kingdom, we even love our enemies and we pray for those who persecute us. It's a whole different world if you step into following Jesus. You have to leave the kingdoms of the world behind. You can't have both. You have to choose which citizenship you want. For a brief moment, you may have dual citizenship as you're called out of the world and into the kingdom of heaven, but you have to let go of citizenship in the world and follow after Jesus. And so chapter 5 of Matthew, which we've now finished, are a bunch of don'ts. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't uh, seek revenge, right? Uh, he goes through the list. Chapter 6 we begin today. And chapter 6 is the do's, the do's of the kingdom, the things we do. And you'll find chapter 6 revolves around three teachings uh, that are based on the, the phrase, when you. So when you pray, when you fast, when you give. Uh, and Jesus uh, lays out these three wins, these things that you do. You are going to pray, and when you do it, here's how to do it. You are going to fast, and when you do it, here's how you do it. You are going to give, and when you do it, here's how you do it. And the focus of these texts is on humility. He, over and over again in these texts, says, don't call attention to it. Don't do this to receive praise from the people around you. Do this just to please your Father in heaven. And that's it. And you have to remember, in the first century Jewish world, people were esteemed for being particularly religious, particularly faithful. It's a bit of a contrast to modern-day America, particularly California, where people may look askance at you if you are Christian. But in the first century Jewish world, if you were devout, you were praised. And so there's a lot of emphasis in this chapter on not calling attention to your good works, but instead doing them just to please God. And so with that, we're going to dive into Matthew chapter 6. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you came to build a kingdom that's better than the kingdoms of this world. Teach us to live into your kingdom and to let go of our own. Teach us to live to honor you when we give and when we pray and when we fast. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Here we go, Matthew chapter 6. You can follow along in your Bible if you've got it open in front of you. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Remember, this was the first century Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, would especially practice their goodness in front of everybody else. They'd pray loudly in the marketplace. Everybody would go, oh, that's a really, that's a good guy right there. That's a devout guy. Jesus says, don't do that. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. God wants to reward you for that which you do sincerely for Him, but if you're doing it just to get attention, just to show off, just to be praised by other people, that's all the reward you're getting. There's this uh, opening scene in the novel uh, Les Mis, uh, the famous novel of Victor Hugo, and it's not in the, the musical Les Mis, so if you've seen Les Mis, you don't know this part, but in the opening chapters of the book, there's a story of the father, the, the priest, who leads the main character, Jean Valjean, to faith in Jesus. And Father Zosima is this, uh, this sort of wise old man who, who runs a parish. And he says, uh, at one point, there's um, a very wealthy man in the church who never gave any money to the church at all. And Father Zosima finally preached a very fiery sermon about, uh, about giving and about selfishness. And so he watched this, this rich man walk out of the church, and there was a, a poor man on the steps of the church. And this rich man takes just a penny, just the smallest coin, and gives it to the the poor man. And Father Zosima says, uh, well, there he goes, buying a penny's worth of heaven. Right? Jesus says, do it because you're trying to please God, not to be uh, seen by uh, people around you. Uh, when you give, give sincerely. Uh, don't, give, uh, don't give selfishly and don't give for attention. Here it is, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, 
Do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Uh, don't let your left hand know what your right hand doing. Uh, what your right hand is doing is a, is an old idiom. And sorry for you lefties, this is another slight on left-handed people because left-handed people are in the minority. And throughout history, people have had all kinds of superstitions and suspicions about left-handed people. Uh, and in the ancient Jewish world, if you sat on the right-hand side of someone, you were blessed and not so much on the left hand. And if you went to pray over someone, you placed your right hand on their head, you blessed them with your right hand, not your left. And so saying, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It means when your right hand is the good hand doing generous things, don't let your selfish hand, your greedy hand, know what your right hand is up to. Don't let your, your selfish motives interfere with your generosity. Sorry, lefties, that's just a, an old, out-of-date way of seeing the world. But Jesus is picking up on, a, on an idiom that they used back then. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, as we get into this, realize Jesus says, when you give, I, I've heard all kinds of preachers go through this chapter and they come to the, the section on when you fast, when you abstain from food for the sake of praying, when you fast. And I've heard preachers, in fact, very prominent preachers say, well, he says, he says when you do it, he doesn't say you have to do it. So fasting isn't required. Listen, I can tell you as a dad, when I say when, I mean will. When I say when you do it, I mean you are going to do it. The command is implied. If I tell my son, when you finish mowing the lawn, put the lawn clippings in the green barrel, that doesn't mean he can say, ah, you said when you do it. Uh, I haven't committed to doing it, so I'm not going to... I'm not going to mow the lawn at all, so I don't, it doesn't apply to me. I don't have to know where to put the grass clippings because I'm not even going to do it in the first place. Your, your antecedent is not uh, requiring the consequent, and so I don't even know, need to know what the consequent is because I'm not going to do the antecedent. He can, get, he can be a lawyer about this, right? I can tell you as a dad, when I say when, I mean will. And the same thing is true here. When Jesus says, when you give, he means you will. It is a command. The command is implied. But this is a beautiful thing. What it says is the default setting of the follower of Jesus living in his kingdom, the default setting is generosity. Generosity is where we begin. It's where we start. It's our default setting. Uh, I can say, uh, uh, when you go to Disneyland, when you ride the rides, uh, listen to the children laughing, right? I say, when you ride the rides, because I'm assuming that's what you're going to do. It, you can go to Disneyland and not ride the rides, but the default setting is that's what you do at Disneyland. So I say when, because it's implied that that's what's happening. Uh, I could say, when you, uh, when you uh, go to the donut man, get a tiger tail, right? Because if you live in Glendora, the default setting is you are going to go to the donut man. You don't have to, but the default setting is you do. And when you do, you should get a tiger tail because they're delicious. <clears throat> I could say... If you spend your life following Jesus and you love Jesus, when you get to heaven, try the bacon. It's amazing, right? Uh, and that's a mandatory setting. You, there's no option there. Uh, Jesus says, when you give, because giving is the default setting. Generosity is the default setting in the kingdom of heaven. When we follow Jesus, generosity is our default setting. One of the major problems with American Christianity is too many of us consider ourselves exceptions to the default settings. You're supposed to be generous. You're not supposed to consider yourself an exception. It's odd to be an exception. And when the majority of people in a movement consider themselves exceptions, something's wrong. If you look at the, the uh, story, of, um, a story of giving in America, it, it shows a lot of people making themselves the exception to the plain teachings of Matthew chapter 6. There, there are certain default settings that we should just be able to take for granted. I should be able to say to a Christian, when you love your enemies, that means you don't speak poorly of them, you don't gossip about them behind your back, you don't go on social media and blast them, even when you're, they're your political enemy, even though when they're a public figure. You don't treat people disgracefully when you're a member of the kingdom, because when you follow Jesus, you love your enemies. That should be the default setting 
And Jesus says to us, when you give to the needy, that's the default setting. That's what we, in principle, are always going to do. If you dig into the scriptures to look at what the Bible says about giving, it sets out a, a platform, it sets out a foundation, it says tithing is the entry point. Tithing is giving 10% of your income to building the kingdom of heaven on earth and specifically keeping centers of worship in the heart of your community. The tithe went to the temple. It didn't go anywhere else and the temple didn't then turn around and give it to someone else. The tithe was to keep a, heart, a, a, a house of worship at the heart of the community. After that, the scriptures then teach, you should care for the poor, and there should be no poor among you. That's the teaching. In fact, it says, if there is a foreigner residing within your gates, within your town, you should take them in and treat them as one of your own. There should be no poor among you. And that's the default setting. That's not the exception. That's how followers of Jesus are supposed to live. The default setting is radical generosity. And yet, over and over again, studies on giving in America show that even people who call themselves born-again Christians, the most devout, the most pious, on average give about 3% of their income to charity. That's a lot of exceptions to the default setting. And if you choose to go through life and never practice, it's not even radical generosity, it's basic generosity. If you, never, if you choose never to tithe, never to start with that foundation, you're making yourself an exception, not just to God's commandments, but to the pathway to God's graces. I've told you before, and I mean this, and I say this every time, if you think I'm doing a fundraiser for our church right now, just mail your money to the church down the street. I don't care. I'm not after your money. I'm surprised Hope Lutheran is not laced in gold for as many times as I've said that right down the street from us. I'm not raising money for the church. I'm talking about the Word of God and God's pathway to living life in His kingdom. And generosity is the default setting. First we tithe, and then we care for the poor. We stop chasing after material comforts just for our own sake, and we live instead to be a blessing to others. That's the default setting. I'm so thankful for this church and its generosity and its graciousness. In the last two weeks, we've had a sponsorship for Compassion International, a multinational nonprofit organization that allows people in developed nations to sponsor children in developing nations, sending them money every month that provides for school and clothing and housing and Christian education. And uh, we've sponsored in the last two weeks 35 children through Compassion International. You can still do it if you want to. Go to reallife.la forward slash compassion and you can choose one of the kids that's listed there. Uh, and it changes a kid's life. I'm so thankful that 35 children and their families and their future children have gone through now a radical life change because of the generosity of our church. I'm so thankful that our church has been so faithful and so consistent about providing a pantry twice a month for people in need. We give out groceries and now a hot breakfast and clothing and we feed a thousand people a month here at our church. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Caring for people in need, including strangers, people who aren't your friends and family, just people in need, is the default setting in the kingdom of heaven. And what a beautiful thing when God's people do it well. Now, that's just behavior, remember? The Sermon on the Mount is not, uh, not solely about behavior. Jesus is moving us from the law of Moses, which was about behavior, do not murder, to matters of the heart, do not hold on to anger. The law of Moses was about behavior, don't commit adultery. Jesus moves us to matters of the heart, don't lust. Uh, Jesus is, is not just calling us to, to do good works, generous works, right? Buying our pennies worth of heaven like in Les Mis. But rather, Jesus is calling us to have hearts that say, I'd rather bless people in need than keep stuff for myself. I'd rather use my resources to care for people who are hungry than to overfeed myself. You've been told, give to the needy, but now I tell you, love caring for people in need because that's a signature of the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're all about. And the promise in all this is that in the kingdom, people will care more about you than their stuff and their belongings. When you're in need, the kingdom of heaven will surround you and God's people will bless you. And when people do it well, it, it makes a mark.
it makes an imprint. It makes a memory. I still remember when I was around 22, 23 years old and I was in seminary. I'd just begun seminary and I was at the time trying to listen to sermons of pastors in the largest churches around America. I figured they're doing something right. People like listening to what they have to say. I want to see what they're doing and how they're doing it. And so I started, now this will date me, I started ordering cassette tapes from different churches uh, around the country. Uh, the a cassette tape kids is this little piece of plastic material with an, an actual roll of film inside of it. And it worked in a way that if, if there was a problem with the, the music you were listening to, you had to put a pencil through this hole and you had to start twisting it and you'd have to twist and twist and twist and twist to try to sort out the tape and get to the place you want. Twist and twist and twist and twist and twist and twist and twist. This was fast forward. Twist and twist and twist and twist and twist and twist. It was 60 minutes long on each side. Twist and twist and twist and I'm not to my next point yet. Twist and twist and twist and twist and twist. And there we go. And that's how cassettes work. Uh, and you can laugh at me for that, but you will never know the joy of looking at someone who's just said something surprising and saying to them, hold on, be kind, rewind. Uh, anyone who has, uh, anyway, uh, when I was in seminary, I was listening to these cassette tapes. And the problem was I was on a limited budget as a student and cassette tapes weren't free and shipping wasn't free. And there was a pastor, I was in seminary in New Jersey and there was a pastor on the West Coast who was uh, an acquaintance of mine. And so I was a little bit bold and I sent him a letter and I said, I, I love, I love your sermons. I wish I could listen to them. I'm trying to study sermons. Is there any way you could make your sermons available in the seminary library so I could check them out, right? Uh, I was trying to make them available to everybody. He said, could you just make them available in the seminary library? And this pastor on the West Coast uh, signed me up to receive a year of free cassette tapes of his sermons mailed to me every single week. And I've never forgotten that because his default setting was generosity. He decided that he would, for free, allow me to listen to these sermons that I wanted to listen to, uh, and I've never forgotten it. That should be the default setting of the people of God. We who follow Jesus, we who live in his kingdom, and it ought to be making memories for the world around us. Now, uh, a great emphasis in this teaching, and all throughout chapter 6, is on humility. Jesus wants to emphasize, now I'm going to tell you, when you do these things, here's how to do it, and especially, don't call attention to yourself. And again, that was a much more of an issue in the first century uh, Judaic world than, there is, than it is in modern America today. Uh, I've been thinking about, um, I've got a book coming out on May 1st uh, called uh, Jesus is Not King, looking at exactly the kind of king he is. Uh, in this election year. Uh, but if, it's already got me started uh, thinking about my, my next book, which is uh, I think going to be titled Humble Like Me by Bishop Jim Miller, uh, the best guide to having an absolutely perfect character uh, from one of the best of the world's exemplars. Uh, in the first century world, you were praised for being particularly religious and putting everything uh, that you were on display. And if you were especially dignified a rabbi or Pharisee, uh, people would just admire you. We do have one thing kind of similar here in modern day America. Uh, we like to take selfies. And sometimes we take selfies when we are doing good works so that we can show everybody else what a good person we are. And honestly, pastors are the worst. Pastors are the worst at this. Pastors like to go out with their, uh, their churches and they, you know, they work at their pantry and they take a selfie of themselves in front of the pantry. Oh, I'm so blessed to be working with these great people of God here at my generous church because I'm such a generous pastor. Pastors are absolutely the worst at this. I, I'm, here I am getting wrecked by Jesus as I care for orphans in a developing nation. You know, selfie of the pastor getting wrecked by Jesus. Jesus says, when you do this, concentrate your attention on your Father in heaven. Don't do it to vie for praise from the people around you. It's not wrong to want approval. That's how the human identity is shaped. But seek approval from the one who matters. Seek approval from God who loves you and who made you and who wants you to do good works and who is proud of you when you do good works and celebrates when you're generous. But just do it for Him. Don't do it so that other people can see. Because if you do, that's all the reward you get. Do it just for Him. Uh, and and don't, don't do it um, 
so that other people will pat you on the back. Uh, Jesus would say to us right now, uh, would you want to live surrounded by my love, uh, unconcerned about what other people think of you, receiving the promise of living in my kingdom? When you want all that, be generous, especially to those who are in need. When you want my approval, don't call attention to your own good works and celebrate yourself and take pictures of yourself. When you do it, be humble about it. Don't do it in front of other people. When you want more of me, pursue less of you. And when I say when, I mean will. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you love us. Give us a spirit of generosity, a heart of generosity, that we might live graciously to the world around us as you were gracious to us. Help us to release our grip on this world and on the, the kingdoms of this world so that we might live fully into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. God bless you. Go be the church. Well, thank you, Pastor Jim, and thank you for joining us online today. We are so honored to be part of your faith walk. If we can support you in any way, please send us email, info at reallife.la, and let us know how we can be praying for you, how we can support you. Uh, you are being prayed for, you're being cheered for. We can hardly wait to see you next time. Take care.